we've ended up at the following place. Our original, our original equation original Schrodinger's equation, actually I don't want to do the time dependent piece, ha has become, um, well, the radial piece we haven't really done anything with yet. The, all of the angular piece, both the theta and the phi, turned into the L sub z operator, whose eigenstate was h bar squared, turned into the L z, sorry, turned into the L squared operator, the square of the angular momentum. All of those derivatives just became operated on the theta and phi solutions and just gave us this eigenvalue. We still have capital R, the radial part of the wave function. And now, let me go ahead and plug in for what the potential is. All right, that's little r. The potential, I just put in the potential energy in a positive sense, but the potential for a hydrogen atom, right, it's an, a charge of E on the proton and a charge of minus E on the electron, so it's just negative E squared over R with the standard normalization in MKS units equals ER. So that's it. That's the radial, um, the radial equation I now have to solve to complete our to complete our work. Uh, I'd like to make one comment at this point. What is this term here? I mean, I just said what it was. The numerator is the eigenvalue of angular momentum squared. So this term is basically L squared over 2MR squared in a classical sense where I'll drop I'm not writing anything exact, I'm just dropping off the R and writing what this classically is. So this is just the rotational energy. This is the rotational piece of kinetic energy. And this is a radial piece of kinetic energy. Right? So this is analogous. In fact, um, you remember when we started doing quantum mechanics and I, wanted, and I wanted to work out an example to show you a bound and an unbound state, I worked out orbital motion. We talked about it there in terms of like gravity in a planet. Um, but it, we got exactly this. We got an L squared over 2MR squared term. Um, this was just classically uh, uh, simpler was one half mr dot squared. This is the quantum mechanical version. But there was a, a radial piece of the kinetic energy, a rotational piece. This was gravitational in that case. Here it's electrical. But the same all holds. And um, there it is. All right? So now how am I going to solve this? Uh, you know, the story should be getting old, I hope, by now. The way you'll solve this is you'll guess. It's really not so crazy. Look, this is just a power of r. It's 1 over r. This is just a power 1 over r squared. This is a bunch of derivatives. So you might guess that I want like a polyno I want a r to the n. Because if I take a derivative of r with r to the n, I get r to the n minus 1. And you know I have one power of r and a different power of r. It turns out that kind of works, but that alone won't do it. We need things like we need things like that, very much like we had for well, this I think you uh, this was like the example for um, simple harmonic oscillator. In fact, the, so, the simplest solution. I'm bereft of erasers. Um, the simplest solution. Let's just try a very simple solution. Let's try. 
R equals A e to the minus R over little a, okay, where little a is clearly going to have units of, of length. Let me just write down the, the derivative term. 1 over r squared d by dr, r squared d by dr of a e to the minus r over a uh, is equal to, uh, the first derivative is simple, brings out a minus 1 over a, I'll put it all the way outside, 1 over r squared d by dr. Um, and uh, then there's an r squared, and this bit, I'll bring the a out front too, capital A, uh, e to the minus r over little a. If I take a derivative of this, clearly there's the first, I'll take the derivative of this, and then I'll take the derivative of that. So I have minus 1 over a, 1 over r squared. Um, capital A, and then 2R uh, e to the minus R over A, and then taking the derivative of that, I'll get minus 1 over A e to the minus R over A. Now A times this is just capital R, the original wave function, so this is um, minus 1 over A 1 over r squared, 2r minus 1 over a times r. That's what that is. Huh? Let me see, a times this and a times that. Yeah, this is quantity. Right, because all I did is I had to take the derivative of this bit, and so I take the derivative of r squared, and I take the derivative of the exponential. All right? Thank you. Okay? That's what you wanted. Thanks. Um, all right? So let's plug that into here. I have minus h bar squared over 2m. In fact, I might to simplify this. Minus 1 over a, 2 over r, minus r over a. Right? Quite simple. And of course, I'm going to have r everywhere. Thanks. And it had to be that way because these had to both have, uni have units of 1 over r. So Now I want to introduce a different a reasoning that's similar to reasoning we used before. If I have an equation like this, and this is again techniques for solving differential equations, I'm expecting to find relationships between these coefficients. But let's look at this thing. I just have a bunch of different terms. Some of them are constant, some of them are 1 over r, some of them are 1 over r squared. Okay. What I should do is I should write this down carefully, collecting the different terms. So I have 1 over r squared times the angular term, h bar squared l times l plus 1 uh, over 2m. Okay, that's this term. Um, then I have some terms that have 1 over r in them. Uh, one of those is um, 2 h bar squared over 2ma. That's this term. And the other one is the, um, 
the potential term. Finally, on the other side of the equation, I had E. And let me just bring this term as a constant over there, plus h bar squared over 2m a squared. The only way that this equation can be satisfied, can you guess? Think about that for a second. This is very analogous reasoning to uh, what you did when you separated variables. And then you said, if I had equations which depend on x and y and z, and I can add them, I can break them into, into groups which sum up to something, then the x part and the y part and the z part or the r theta and phi, they all have to be constant independently. Because clearly if, if, if x is fixed, if I pick a point in x and look around in y, I still have to solve the equation. Similarly here, if this equation is valid, in other words, if this is a solution, it has to work no matter what the value of r is. So what has to happen to all three terms? They all three have to be separately zero. Not just a constant, but zero. Because I can pick a term, for instance, if I take r to be infinity, then this better be zero, because the, the, the left-hand side will be zero. OK? And, 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 and uh, uh, OK? So, um, so therefore, this is zero. We didn't really select what L was. And look, now we got a result on L. This result, this, this solution only works if L equals zero. We got an answer for the energy. The energy is minus h bar squared over 2m, 1 over a squared. That's the energy of the state, whatever a was up here. And this term gives me an answer for A, right? Let me see. Uh, the two cancel. Um, and so A is 4 pi epsilon naught. Lots of old scrolls here. 4 pi epsilon naught h bar squared over m e squared. That negative sign means that this is positive. OK? This is a very important result. Basically, this, this solution, which I'm going to call the first solution for reasons that will become apparent in a minute, has some constant, which is given in the book. You can look it up. It has a 0 in it. It has the little a in it. e to the minus r. And it's so fundamental we put a subscript 0 on this um, a. And that's the value of a 0. It has an energy. That's the energy. And it has l equals 0, which implies what physically? The angular momentum is 0. So it's a no, it's a state where the electron is effectively not spinning. That is not a classical state. The, the analogy in planetary motion would be it's an orbit around the sun of a planet that wasn't rotating. OK? That's what it is. Um, but it has some energy. And it's not, it's, and, it's a, and it's a wave function that has this behavior, right? It just looks like, or sorry, I'm plotting it upside down. I was sketching the energy. It looks like that. And what's, it's got a characteristic length, a0. If you solve a0 numerically from those constants there, this is a very famous result. It's, five point, it's 0.529 angstroms. And angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. Our book is stubbornly MKS and wrote down 5.29 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. OK, fine. But actually, um, this is the right way to think about it. An angstrom is the scale of, a, of atoms. And that typical orbital size of the simplest solution to the Schrodinger's equation for a hydrogen atom has this scale in it, 0 0.529 angstroms. This here, with the A, 0, is written in slightly different terms than you should have seen uh, last Friday, no, last Wednesday, when you solved the, you know, the sort of the when, you, when we found this the classical way, starting with the angular momentum condition, 
but it's the same result. This is the bull. This remarkably turns out, or maybe not remarkably, but this had to be. This turned out to be the same result as from the classical treatment of the Bohr, Bohr atom. And if you plug in these numbers, it's minus 13.6 EV. Okay? Okay, so now to comment a little further on, um, on these solutions, I said that in general you might expect solutions of the form r to the n, uh, e to the minus r over a. If you play with things, it turns out you can write down solutions of the form 1 plus r plus r squared plus dot 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 up to an r, or let me write this a little bit differently, r to the 0 um, plus r to the 2 minus, one, minus 1 plus r to the 3 minus 1 plus dot 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 up to r to the n minus 1, each with some coefficient, a1, a2, a3, dot, 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 an. E to the minus r, they all have only this form, a0 with n there. Okay? It's not important that you memorize that, but there's a couple features I want to point out. It's a polynomial in r. The biggest number is r to the n minus 1, and the exponent has r over n times this Bohr radius. 0.529 angstroms, and I say it's the Bohr, it's called the Bohr radius. And uh, that's the form it takes. Okay, so n a if n is big, then this 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 scale here is much bigger, and the exponential is, extends over a much bigger space. The wave function is much more spread out for the higher n states. And in that case, and I don't get it from just this, but you can imagine plugging this complicated thing in, finding relationships. What you learn is that this is equal to e. 1, the 13.6 EV solution, divided by n squared. In other words, by 13.6 EV over n squared. And just as here L was 0, L turns out to be allowed to have any value at once up to n. So if this thing has power r squared, that's n of um, 3, because it was r to the n minus 1, and l was equal to 2, or, zero, or 1, or 0. And those are the basic rules of, of basically of, of atoms. And this is what makes up the periodic table, although we've only talked about a single state around an electro, uh, in, in hydrogen yet. Still, this is the basis for, for most of atomic physics. Okay. Um, a couple further comments. The um, uh, the L equals zero state has a name which is S. This is called spectroscopic notation. Can you think why it would be called spectroscopic notation? Think historically how this was developed, right? The first thing that happened is people saw spectra of atoms, which you learned about. You, were, you guys discussed this last Wednesday, right? The, 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 the Lyman out, the Lyman series, and things like that, right? And so they came up with these, they just literally looked at these light spectra and they named the lines, or the groups of lines. Now that we fully understand things, L equals one is called P, L equals two, D, L equals three, F, then after that, it just goes alphabetically. G, blah, blah, blah. They're, well, you run out pretty quickly in terms of atoms we actually have. 
SPDF are commonly encountered orbitals for the sort of moderate sized elements. Okay? These, these guys here, where L equals zero, what physical shape do they have not thinking about R? Spherical, right? Remember what the solution was. This is the theta with L equals zero, then M sub L is zero, and so this is phi, which was zero. That was a constant when M sub L was zero. This was also a constant for L equals zero. For L equals one, it starts to have more features, et cetera, okay? And so now I make one final comment. Well, maybe not final, but one more comment. One thing that's interesting is that this term was the kinetic energy of rotation, right? And for sure there's energy involved in that. It's L squared over 2M. That's kinetic energy of rotation, classically. And yet, here's the formula for the energy. And um, I should put a sub N here. There's the formula for the energy of the state, and L doesn't appear. OK? So that perhaps is a little puzzling. There must be this term. I could take, for instance, the expectation value of this operator, and it's L squared over, t it's h bar squared L times L plus 1 over 2 mr squared. So it's non-zero. There really is kinetic energy there. It must be that there, effectively the kinetic energy in the radial direction uh, also depends on L in a way that cancels. And so this is called an accidental degeneracy. If I have the n equals 2 state, I'll have an L equals 0 and L equals 1 states in it. And they'll have different shapes, and there'll be different amounts of orbital, angular, orbital energy, but that's going to somehow be, that's going to be exactly canceled by radial motion, the, the energy associated with radial motion, not cancel, but the, the two of them will sum to be the same for all this, you know, for the, for the L equals zero and L equals one states. Similarly, if I take L equals, N equals four, the L equals three, two, one, and zero states, all those two terms exactly sum to the same amount. That's sort of an accident of uh, a purely radially symmetric potential. In an actual heavy atom, Sorry, an atom other than just a proton with an electron orbiting where the potential is truly spherically symmetric, um, that, that degeneracy, and remember degeneracy is the term for quantum mechanical states where several states have the same energy. It's a kind of uninteresting concept in classical mechanics, but it's an important concept, even though a simple one, in quantum mechanics. Uh, a system where there's, a, there's several states with the same energy. That's what this is. Those degeneracies are broken in a real atom because the effect of, the, of each electron on, on any one electron, any, sorry, it's broken in any atom other than hydrogen because if you have more than one electron, each one doesn't see a purely symmetric potential. It sees the effects of the other electrons. And so then L actually enters. But in real, in real atoms, the basic feature remains that the energy dominantly depends on this number N and then at a lesser extent depends on L, okay? And that may be something you've learned from chemistry when you learn the ordering rules in which electrons go into states, okay? It follows from this basic idea. Any questions at this point? All right. Um, A few more things to just discuss. Uh, let me work here. If I want to calculate a probability, I'm about to tell you something that's uh, it's, it's important. Uh, it's a little bit, it's not directly just solving the wave equation, um, but it's a bit math, it's just a, a bit of math you need to know. You may or may not have seen it somewhere along the way. If I want to, cal to calculate the probability of something, 
Remember, we talked about the probability in, say, in one dimension was psi star psi, the spatial part squared. I should include the time part, but it always went away, OK? If I go to 3D, Well, sorry, let me, let me back up one step. I'm going to go to 3D here, but remember that in 1D, I also said that the probability function in and of itself was a bit slippery because if I wanted a real fraction, a number like 10% or, or, or you know, 0.1, I can't use P alone. I've always got to look at P times DX. That, that's something that's finite. Okay? So the question is what happens when I go to three dimensions? If, the, if, you, if your coordinates are Cartesian, it's very, very straightforward. If this is your wave function in x, your wave function in y, your wave function in z, you would just do this. And this would be the probability of x between x and x plus dx and y. Let me try it a little bit differently. And y is between y and y plus dy. And similarly uh, for z. In other words, I want to think of in a three-dimensional coordinate system, I have to think of about a little volume in space here, a little cube. Uh, of psi dx in that direction, dz in this direction, and uh, dy, that, so that's dx uh, there, this is dy here, that's dz, right? This is x, y, z. In other words, I'm taking three little slices, they pick out a little cube, in the volume of that cube multiplied by the wave function in that cube, that's the probability of the, of the particle being in that, cube, in, that, in that cube. Or I can calculate something like momentum, but I'll be calculating it in that cube, OK? And I definitely need to work with the cube. If I take a single point by the type of arguing reasoning you've always done, the probability at, at, a, at a vanishingly small and infinitely small point is infinitely small and is not interesting. That was straightforward, OK? What's not straightforward is if I go to the r theta phi components, right? If here's my x, y, z coordinate system, and I have quiet. If you go to the x, y coordinate system, and here's r, we want to know what's going on at an r and a theta and a phi in a dr, a d theta, and a d phi, right? And so I have to draw a little box here where I vary dr. I also have to vary theta in some d theta, OK? And then finally, Here's phi. I have to take an angle d phi, which this is sort of hard to draw, um, but is getting me a little volume where this piece is due to d phi. OK? But it's not quite so straightforward. This arc length is r d theta. Well, actually, it is straightforward, but it's not just trivial. That arc length is r d theta. This arc length is not r d phi, because phi was defined down in this plane. That arc length is d phi times that arm. That arm is r sine theta, because this was theta. So this is times d phi. This is times r sine theta d phi. This piece here is often just written as dv, the volume element. It's just a shorthand for writing dx, dy, dz. In three-dimensional space, I want to turn this into 
dv equals r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. All right? So the probability written this way If I still want to write it mathematically as dr d theta d phi, I'll say r capital theta capital phi, but then I have to write down r squared sine theta and then dr d theta d phi. So let me, in fact, since I've run out of boardroom, just write it this way. Okay? So the point was. I think that's my iPhone talking to the pro broadcast piece. The point was instead of just writing down R, um, oh, sorry, these have to be squared too, right? Complex conjugate squared. Instead of just writing down the wave function complex conjugate squared, I have to write it down and I have to multiply that by R squared and sine theta. Now the sine theta looks like a bit of a mess. Uh, but what we do with that, in fact, when we created our wave functions theta and phi, we actually set the normalization condition, which was that theta squared times phi squared, and of course that was just simply one, that these things integrated over their volume Okay? And so that's to multiply sine theta d theta d phi. In other words, if I have this as the chunk of the volume, I can just integrate in this direction and that direction. I could, I'll just pick up the sine theta piece and d theta and d phi. I'll ignore the r squared dr because that's in the radial direction. And that was defined as 1. Okay? Uh, and so that, and so basically, that's just saying that I'm sine theta, d theta d phi is one. And so at the end of the day, if I ask the probability in R, that's basically saying I integrated over theta and phi. I leave off the dr, I just write the probability. The probability in R, after all this discussion, is just R times R, capital R, the wave function squared, complex conjugate squared, times little r squared. Okay? This actually, I mean, that in some sense should be a familiar result. If you have something where you're talking about a sphere, if you ask, well, what's the surface area? It's 4 pi r squared. So if you go to bigger and bigger r, the amount you're talking about on a sheet goes like r squared. So if I want to say what's the probability in a little shell centered at some r, I want to multiply that by the fact that the shell is getting bigger and bigger and bigger just geometrically. That's why the r squared appears. Incidentally, if you simply integrate sine theta d theta d phi, where phi rotates around 0 to 2 pi, and theta goes from 0 to pi, because if you want to cover all of space, theta just comes from here to here, while phi goes around once. I invite you just to do that integral, you get far pi. In fact, that's how you derive the, folio, the formula for the surface area of a sphere. It's just the integral of that bit. Anyway, OK. And by the way, do you guys, do you guys know there's a term there's a term for this piece here. For the sine theta, d theta, d phi. Have you guys heard it? Do you know what the term for that is? It's written that way. It's called solid angle. OK? It's a nice, uh, high sounding term. It simply means, I mean, the, the thought is simple. If I'm integrating along the x-axis, I integrate with dx. If I want to integrate around on a spherical surface, um, 
a little patch of surface that has a small, you know, small differential piece, has that size. This is essentially in square radians, which are called stir radians, because it was two dimensions of angle, and it's called solid angle. So you'll often hear physicists use the term, what was the solid angle for a process? And what they mean is, um, if I'm trying to shoot out the light with a gun, uh, and we're saying, how hard is it? We basically want to say, well, how, much of a, how big an angle does it make in the sky for me? Okay, and I just think in terms of that, you know, sort of the, well, it's simply not one direction, it's just two direction of angle. So we call it a solid angle in the sense that it was you know, a solid because it was in two angle, two directions at once. Just a simple idea. That's the solid angle. Solid in, uh, angle integrated over theta and phi is 4 pi. Okay. Okay, so having said that, I'm now in a position to plot the radial wave, the probability that an electron is at some location R. And there's, this is in your book. And I, I invite you to really look at it in your book, because they're going to do a better job sketching it than I am. But it does look like the following. Versus R, and once again, I want to plot the probability in R, which, as we just said, is R star R, R squared. I'm also plotting on this axis the energy. I'll also overlay the potential energy. It looks something like that. Um, the lowest energy state down here, E1, minus 13.6 EV. E2 which is at E1 over 4. E3 is at E1 over 9. E4 would be about here. And then the spacing between these things is getting finer and finer and finer. OK? The lowest order wave function, what was it? It's the first thing I solved today. I showed that a simple exponential was the first, was the lowest wave function, the, the E1. But the probability is R squared. It's, it's, it's that squared, 2R, and then R squared, right? So this thing actually had finite probability at the origin, finite it was peaked at the origin. This is, you know, this is just rolls off from the origin. But this, because basically at the origin, the surface area, the sphere has got a really small surface, the probability actually goes to zero there. And so this thing looks like this. Well, this is the probability for, for state one. Okay? And it turns out, if you say where is the peak, it's right at A0. Not a surprise, OK? And in fact, that's a simple little min-max problem. What's the peak of this? Do the differential, minimize that, maximize it, and you'll find that it's A0. Um, the next wave function, well, actually, there's two, right? This is, the L, this, is the N equals, this is the N equals 1 state with L equals 0. This is the n equals 2 state with l equals either 0 or 1. And uh, one of them looks like this, where this, if that's a0, this is 2 squared a0. And this is 3 squared a0. So it sort of has two humps. And uh, it's peaked around 2a0, although not exactly at it. I've drawn the 2s state. The L equals zero state. The P state uh, looks more like this. Okay. The key point here was that there were uh, there was one zero at least in the S state. 
I think I draw that backwards. This No, I'll leave that alone. Um, and then the, the three state, the probability is centered out here, although there are these smaller lobes down closer in, et cetera. And this spacing in, in, in radius is going like n squared a, OK? So the bigger states are much further out than the lower end states. Looked at in three dimensions, the state with one zero is basically two donuts, right? Because the zero here means there's, you know, you know, this sort of, so there's a, this thing is a sort of, a, is, a, is a donut, a torus, and then there's a bigger torus. And the one state, the electron is somehow all, all in there all at once. And there's just a probability that it's in any one location. Okay? And so finally, to sum up sort of the information we've learned, we can make a table, which is instructive. And although that what I'm telling you has been qualitative, I want you to know it. I want you to look in the book. I want you to remember this stuff. Because this is basic. This is important. You know, this is the basis of uh, how atoms work. If I write down N and L, and m sub l, if n is 1, l is 0. m sub l I haven't spoken about today, but right, we talked about it in previous days. The rules for m sub l is that it's 0 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2 dot 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 up to plus or minus l, where l was going from 0, 1 up to n minus 1. So now if I have n equals 2, I can have L equals 0 or L equals 1. If L equals 0, M sub L equals 0. If L equals 1, M sub L is 0 or plus and minus 1. If L equals 3, this could be 0 or 1 or 2, for which this M sub L is 0, 0 or plus or minus 1. 0 or plus or minus 1 or plus or minus 2. All right? And these are basically the rules you learned about filling orbitals in an atom. Who knew? It just came out of um, solving these differential equations and looking at the conditions imposed on these numbers. Well, that's probably not the right way to look at it. I mean, it's all together. I mean, there's sort of physical interpretation of all this, and of course it meshes with the mathematical solutions to the Schrodinger equation. An interesting thing to write down here is the degeneracy. In other words, the number of states with same energy. There's one energy here. This is an energy, so sorry, I don't want to put it there. There's one state, two state, three state, four state. Um, I feel like I'm reading one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. But one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And of course, this table continues. Dot, 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 dot. All right. Note, of course, when I have 0 and plus or minus 1, that's three different states. The different m sub l's of different, or different states. OK? Any questions? You guys have been in completely silent today, except to point out my algebra mistakes. Yeah? So does the NRC continue to follow that uh, n squared pattern? Yes, if you're clever, like, Oh, wait a minute. Is it exactly like 1, 4, 9, 16? Uh, that's a nice homework assignment. You could be like Euler. This is the pattern you have to figure out, and um, you tell me. I actually should know, but I don't. I probably did know, but I've forgotten. It, it might. You could invent a, um, a code based on this pattern. Yes. 
All right, th these are the rules that generated that, and uh, I invite you to figure out once you report back. All right. So any questions? Let me do just one step of the next thing. Why do I care about angular momentum? I've talked a lot about L. I've talked a lot about M sub L. I drug you through, and in fact, I assigned directly on homework to repeat the derivation um, of L sub Z being that D by D phi piece. It is a, I, I gave you a long homework, but some of it is pretty straightforward. I told you just to repeat what I did in class, OK, um, at one part, at least one problem. Why do I talk about angular momentum? Well, I think the basic answer is that it's what the electron does. I mean, it's sort of like asking if I have a planet, why do I ask about it orbiting? Well, it's because it's what the planet does, right? The electrons are spinning around, and they're, they're just stuck spinning there. So you might as well ask about how they're spinning. It's just a basic feature of what the electron does. OK, so let's think about it some more. What effect does that spin have? And let me just do one thing, and we'll stop. Let's go back to a and m. Basic a and m, well, it's not completely basic. If you have a ring of charge, a current in a loop flowing, and the loop has an area a, do you know what that is? I don't know. I don't quite know if you covered this in your last class. Did you cover this? There's a, OK, there's Ampere's law, which is going to tell us about the magnetic field. But that particular configuration, not an infinite wire, but a wire in a loop, do you know what that's called? That's a magnetic dipole. This is the thing that creates the most basic, simple little magnetic field. So um, the, the, the magnetic field is doing this. It's a dipole, ah, I times A. This is called the dipole moment. That's the current, that's the area. You know, just pi r squared for this thing. OK? And, you know, look, I don't have time to review all of this, but you should just remember the point being that if a simple, not like a wire that we lay down in the room, but if a simple particle is going to have some interaction, it has a charge, it has Coulomb's force, we've already dealt with that. The next thing it might do is interact with magnetic fields or create magnetic fields. And if it's a simple, small thing, the way you want to think about it is this dipole moment. Okay, because obviously an atom is very small, the orbit's very tiny. And so basically, and let me just do two lines of algebra here. Um, basically, if I have an electron running around in a loop, so basically any of his orbitals where I've got a well-defined component of the Z component of angular momentum, so I basically have the electron, one electron here running in a loop, I want to calculate i times a, which will be i times pi r squared. What's the current? That's going to be mu. Well, it's a little bit funny, right? It's one electron, and classically, you know, it's not a continuous current. It's one electron running in a loop. But, you know, the quantum mechanically, right, it's this wave function, which is, you know, sort of all around the loop all at once, and sort of, you know, it is rotating, but another word, in other words, but on the other hand, phi. The probability in azimuthally is constant. So OK, I shouldn't be too worried that I'm going to say one electron, I'm going to kind of blur my eyes, you know, fuzz my eyes out, and let it just run around. So what I'll simply say is current is charge per time. So I'll just say that's an electron over the length of time to go around once. So divided by 2 pi r over v. Right, that's the period of an orbit, right? A distance divided by time um, is, 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 is it a distance divided by velocity is a time, OK? So this is just EV over 2 pi r. That's the current. So mu is um, uh, E, and then this is velocity, not, not capital V, EV pi cancels r over um, 2 pi. 
And V, I don't like in quantum mechanics. I want to put M there and divide by M. And MV is P. And P and all of that is, is R times P is L. So this is E L. Uh, and I multiplied by a pi, so this went away. Apologies. Over 2M. That's what I wanted, and I'll stop there. Mu. Now, if this is an electron, the charge is negative. Minus E. Minus E over 2M times L. So we put a little subscript on the, on the, on the magnetic moment. OK. So what we'll talk about next time, a magnetic dipole interacts with a magnetic field in interesting ways. It's sort of the other thing about the electron that's interesting, how it's going to interact with a magnetic field. And we see that the way to think about it is it's got a magnetic dipole moment, which is directly related to the angular momentum. That's no surprise, because the angular momentum is telling me how it's whirling around. All right, see you Friday.